So we're going we're gonna to kick off the book of Ezra and uh, Nehemiah for the next few months, and I'd like to look at a timeline just real quickly if you have that first slide. This basically is kind of a composite of what happens in these two books that we're going to look at. That's 538 B.C., Cyrus is king of Persia, and he makes this decree in 479, Esther, as we read that story, you know, it's always Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. She becomes queen, and it's still in Babylon. And then 458, almost 80 years later, is when Ezra actually comes to Jerusalem. And then later, and then approximately 13 years after that, Nehemiah arrives. So this is kind of just a little bit of a timeline as to what's going on. In 530, the theme of the book in Ezra is the word of the Lord. And there are 10 direct references to God's word in this book. The key to this book is found in Ezra 9, 4, and 10, 3. And I just like these words. They trembled at the words of the God of Israel. It's interesting to note that when Cyrus issues this decree that we will read today, Daniel was his prime minister. Isn't that something? that Daniel was his prime minister. And evidently David, I mean Daniel and possibly others, led Cyrus to a knowledge of the living and true God. It's also amazing that almost 200 years before Cyrus becomes king of Persia, the prophet Isaiah says this, When I say of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, he will certainly do as I say, he will command Rebuild Jerusalem. He will stay, restore the temple. As we read and study these two books for the next probably three months, it once again reminds us of God's overall sovereignty in the affairs of man. I'd like to read you a little quip from a good book that a brother gave me. The view of the purpose of the universe is further strengthened by what may be called the residential, the the residual argument. If one wants to know the meaning and purpose of history, he must look at the end, the final outcome, the net result. Since prophecy is history written in advance, we have history's final chapter in the book of Revelation. Turning to the closing pages, what emerges as the finished product of the ages It is one thing and one alone, the eternal companion of Jesus Christ, holy God and holy man, the final and ultimate outcome and goal of events from eternity to eternity, the finished product of all the ages is the spotless bride of Christ, united with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb and seated with her heavenly bridegroom upon the throne of the universe, ruling and reigning with him over an ever-increasing and expanding kingdom, he entered the stream of human history for this one purpose, to claim his beloved. Thus, the church, and only the church, is the key to and the explanation of history. The church, blood-washed and spotless, is the center, the reason, and the goal of all God's vast creative handiwork. Therefore, history is only the handmaiden of the church, and the nations of the world are but puppets manipulated by God for the purposes of his church. Creation has no other aim. History has no other goal. From before the foundation of the world until the dawn of eternal ages, God has been working toward one grand event, one supreme end the glorious wedding of his son, the marriage supper of the Lamb. We are going to see God's sovereignty throughout this book. It's incredible, I think. These two books are but two events that are filled with God's truth and that reveal to us how God uses people to accomplish his overall reaching goal. The book of Ezra begins with Cyrus' decree, and chapters 1 through 6 describe the first remnant returning to Palestine, led by a man 
by the name of Zerubbabel. And between chapters 6 and 7, there's a period of approximately 60 years. And during that time occurs the dramatic story of Queen Esther, who is still in Babylon. Then in chapter 7 through 10, it recounts Ezra's journey to Jerusalem that occurred approximately 80 years after Cyrus's decree. I would like us all to stand as we read from his book. And I'm going to read from three different chapters. <clears throat> This is Ezra chapter 1. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and send it throughout his kingdom. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any of you who are his people, may go to Jerusalem and Judah to rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, who lives in Jerusalem. And may your God be with you. Wherever this Jewish remnant is found, let their neighbors contribute toward their expenses by giving them silver and gold and supplies for the journey and livestock, as well as a voluntary offering for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Then God stirred the hearts of the priests and the Levites and the leaders of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of the Lord. And all their neighbors assisted by giving them articles of silver and gold, supplies for the journey and livestock. They gave them many valuable gifts in addition to all the voluntary offerings. King Cyrus himself brought out the articles that King Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the Lord's temple in Jerusalem and placed in the temple of his own gods, and Cyrus directed Mithradath, the treasurer of Persia, to count these items and present them to Sheshbazar, the leader of the exiles returning to Judah. This is a list of the items that were returned, gold and silver and incense burners and gold bowls and silver bowls. And in all, there were 5,400 articles of gold and silver. Sheshbazar brought all these along when the exiles went from Babylon to Jerusalem. Chapter 2. When they arrived at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, some of the family leaders made voluntary offerings toward the rebuilding of God's temple on its original site, and each leader gave as much as he could. Total of their gifts came to all that. Ezra 3, in early autumn, when the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled in Jerusalem with a unified purpose. Then Joshua, son of Jehozadak, joined his fellow priests and Zerubbabel, son of Shatil, with his family in rebuilding the altar of the God of Israel. They wanted to sacrifice burnt offerings on it as instructed in the law of Moses, the man of God. And even though the people were afraid of the local residents, they rebuilt the altar at its old site. Then they began to offer or sacrifice burnt offerings on the altar to the Lord each morning and evening. Chapter 3. Verse 10, when the builders completed the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests put on their robes and took their places to blow their trumpets, and the Levites, descendants of Asaph, clashed their cymbals to praise the Lord, just as King David had prescribed. With praise and thanks, they sang this song to the Lord. He is so good. His faithful love for Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout, praising the Lord because the foundation of the Lord's temple had been laid. But many of the older priests, Levites, and other leaders who had seen the first temple wept aloud when they saw the new temple's foundation. Then others, however, were shouting for joy. The joyful shouting and weeping mingled together in a loud noise that could be heard far in the distance. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, so many, so many things going on in these three chapters. Lord, thank you for recording it. 
Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the book that we can read, we can remember, and we can see your hand in the lives of nations and peoples. I pray, Father, you'd receive all the glory. You'd receive all the honor. Just thank you again, Lord, for this day that you've made. In Jesus' name, amen. I have a couple points for you today, but I'm going to grab my water real quick. My first point, God stirs. If you look at that Ezra chapter 1, those verses 1 through 5, you'll find it twice. He uses that word, stirs. Strong's Concordance says stirs means this, to open one's eyes, to wake up. So when it says that God stirred in the heart of Cyrus and God stirred in the heart of some of the people, he was opening their eyes. He was waking them up. They've been in captivity for a long, long, long time. But God was stirring. He was doing it. Twice in these verses, we see the words, he stirred and God stirred. We see from the very beginning of this book that God's purposes will be accomplished regardless of nations and kingdoms' activities. Rest assured, church, no matter what's going on in this world, God is the sovereign ruler and authority of it all. And he's directing king's hearts like channels of water to accomplish his purpose. Even today, the days may be dark, yet God is right here to guide us, to protect us, and to help us. Amen? God was preparing his people as they were in Babylon in captivity. Major changes begin in one's life on the inside as God works on our attitudes and on our beliefs and on our desires. And these changes will lead to action on our part. After 70 years of captivity, the Jewish nation had been humbled. And when the people's attitudes and desires changed, God ended their punishment and gave them another opportunity to go home and try again. It is just as true today. No matter how you have failed in the past, God gives you an opportunity today, amen, for a new beginning. I have this quote on my desk. You are always one decision away from a totally different life. Many Jews chose to go to Jerusalem, but many more chose to remain in Babylon. The journey would have taken four months. It would be dangerous. It would have been difficult. Travel conditions were poor. Jerusalem was in ruins, and the people living in the area were hostile. Returning to Jerusalem would have meant giving up everything and starting over. And many people couldn't bring themselves to do it. Their priorities were upside down. So to today, we must not let our comfort, we must not let our security, we must not let our material possessions prevent us from doing what God wants. Doing God's will begins with our desires. Are we willing to be humble? Are we willing to be open to his opportunities and to move at his direction? 
May we all ask God to give us the desire to follow him more closely like the remnant of Jews that followed him in Zerubbabel back to Jerusalem. God stirs. He's got to do the work. Number two, God provides. I'm not going to read all those verses again, but you can look it up. Talks about all the gold, talks about all the silver, talks about all that they gave. Provides, I like the meaning of the word provides, to supply or make available. Hudson Taylor said this, God's work done in God's way will never lack. God supplies. This is another good story. Thank you, Jay, for these books. I've enjoyed each and every one of them. If you want to ever get a guy to give you books about prayer, talk to Jay Yowsling, wherever he's at. I can't see him right now. but Is he here? Well, there he is right there. Jay, hold your hand up. This man is a prayer warrior. You ever want a book on prayer, he'll give it to you. Prayer answers by the bunch. In a disease-ridden concentration camp during World War II, Darlene Diebler. I remember early on in our faith, we were at a camp at Hidden Acres in central Iowa over by Boone, and I remember getting a book, and my wife got it, Evidence Not Seen. It was about a missionary, and her name was Darlene Diebler, and he, she was from that little town in Boone, Iowa, a little country town. Yeah, that's right. You know the place. Dar Darlene Diebler found her faith severely tested and surprisingly strengthened. She and her husband, Russell, were working as missionaries in New Guinea. When they were captured by the Japanese, he died in the prison camp. She became quite ill, but lived to tell about it in her autobiography, Evidence Not Seen. She often found worms and insects swimming around in her soup. Though she was repulsed, she knew she had to eat. So she, so she learned to crush the worms and insects in her fingers and eat them with her soup. She developed severe dysentery and diarrhea, and the Epsom salts and quinine she received did no good. She also seemed to be suffering from malaria and beriberi. Finally, she prayed, Lord, I'm being constantly reinfected by these flies. So if it please you, heal me. After praying, she felt that the Lord would heal her as she had requested. So she refused her daily doses of Epsom salts and quinine on, and all the symptoms left her. Sometime later, as she looked out the window of her cell, she saw a person with some bananas in the distance. She began to crave a banana, just a bite. She could smell the bananas and almost taste them. The craving grew unbearable, dropping to her knees. She prayed, Lord, I'm not asking you for a whole bunch. I just want one banana. Lord, just one banana. Then she realized how foolish it was to pray such a thing. How could God possibly get a banana to her through the prison walls? There was more of a chance of the moon falling out of the sky than one of the guards bringing me a banana, she realized, bowing her head again. She prayed, Lord, there's no one here who could get a banana to me. There's no way for you to do it. Please don't think I'm not thankful for the rice porridge. It's just that, well, those bananas look so delicious. In Real Stories for the Soul, Robert Morgan tells how the Lord answered Darlene's prayer the next morning. This is in his book. The next morning, she heard the guard coming down the concrete walkway. The door opened, and it was the warden of the POW camp who had taken kindly to her. He looked down at her emaciated body. And without saying a word, he turned and left, locking the door behind him. Sometime later, she heard another set of footsteps, and the door opened. The guard threw a huge yellow bundle into the cell, saying, they're yours. She counted them. It was a bundle of 92 bananas. 
as she began peeling her bananas, Ephesians 3.20 came to her mind. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. She never again read that verse without thinking of bananas. Indeed, God answers. God's answers sometimes come in bunches. Excuse me. God supplies, thank you so much, Noah. God provides. God provides. He's the one. God's work done in God's way will never lack. God supplies. In Ezra 1 and Ezra 2, we see two principles that describe the people's giving. It was voluntary and it was generous. Everyone contributed according to his or her ability. Everyone's efforts and cooperation was necessary. And the people gave as much as they could. They were working together for a common goal. As God's people respond to whatever the needs are, it's incredible how it affects our attitudes. The people put what resources they had to their best use, and they were enthusiastic and sincere. And money, 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 money. Money often reveals what's going on in one's heart and in one's relationship with God. And as I reflect upon Candlewood's history, this spirit of generosity has been incredibly evident. We can all be partners in this ministry. We all have a part to play and something that is really incredible is that someday we are to be rewarded. Every person's work will be inspected with a reward in mind. We will all, as believers, someday appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames in 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Someday I, we, are going to see just what we did with this life that God has so freely given us. And we take every opportunity that God sets before us and honor him with what we do. God stirs, God provides, and lastly, God unites. You look in Ezra 3, 1 through 3 and 10 through 13, but the word unites is this. Come or bring together for a common purpose or action. The people, the Jewish remnant were united. They were united together with a, with a purpose, and that unity was to build this altar, and then to lay down the foundation of the temple right in the face of their enemy. But they were united. They came together for a common purpose or action. My experience in this Christian walk is that when we step out in faith, opposition will occur. Jewish remnant was afraid that they were going to be attacked by the surrounding people. So where did they turn? They turned to God, and they built an altar. They felt that by honoring God that he would protect them from their enemies. These people who had returned from, camp, from captivity displayed an incredible unity. They were united. 
Psalm 133, 1. How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony, in unity. These people, a lot of them, who had come back to the land, they were poor. They were humble folk. They were not seeking position. They were just trying to do God's will. They were tired of their captivity. They wanted to honor God with their life. They wanted, they wanted to make a mark. They wanted to do something. They first built an altar. And then they were on to the temple. Completing the foundation for the temple required a great effort on the part of all who were involved. These last verses, 10 through 13 there, of chapter 3, reveal that no one tried to get praise for oneself or for one hard work. No, instead everyone praised God for what had been done. So too at Candlewood. All that has happened here, all that has happened here, all the, all the gospel presentations that have gone forth, all the prayers that have been prayed, all the people's lives that have been touched, is because of you, is because of God. It's because of peoples, their talents, their abilities, their attitudes, their strengths. We've been introducing all these serving teams and asking you to join us. Volunteer, serve, join us. Be part of something. Don't be a consumer. Come down to the field and play. May we too, like the Jews of old, thank God for what has been done in and through us. To God be the glory. Amen? So in conclusion, God is the one who, ha who stirs us up. I'm so thankful for the stirrings that have occurred in my life with God. So thankful that I didn't shut his voice off. I'm so thankful that I heard, that I listened, that I responded. How about you? See, God's the one who stirs us up. God's the one who provides for us. You can never outgive God. Money is always about faith. God's the one who provides. I think of this church and even at the annual business meeting when Steve was sharing all those things. You guys are just incredible. Thank you. And lastly, God is the one who unites us. He's the one who's got to bring us together for a cause, for a purpose beyond ourselves. It's got to be beyond ourselves. It can't be for the next football game. It can't be for the next election. It's got to be something greater, greater beyond this world that we're, that we're living for. He stirs us up. He provides for us. He unites us. And with that, I'd ask that you'd stand again. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for today, and we thank you, Lord, for the story of Ezra and Nehemiah, and we're going to be looking at it here for the next few months. Thank you, Lord, that really, as, as, that, as this book just begins, it just shows the overall sovereignty and power of you over the kingdoms and the nations of the world. 
And you're working it all to a conclusion, Lord. And that conclusion is someday, someday, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Lord, we look forward to that day. Help us, Lord, to be on mission with you. Help us, Lord, to be united with you. Just thank you, God, again. I thank you for the Candlewood family. I thank you for all that they've done, all that they do. Pray that you just richly bless each and every one. Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Thank you for your attention. Have a wonderful Sunday. Lead us in worship, please.